morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just give us a second while I navigate my way down here. Uh, Greg, good morning. Good morning. Beautiful morning in Adelaide. Uh, and uh, we're here uh, in the fabrication room. Uh, and yesterday you saw Liam grinding this particular piece. Um, and it's a suitable piece to be discussing the methods of the making of continuous division. Uh, Greg, if you can just go through the welding, the grinding, the welding, the grinding process, um, and just uh, as to uh, how and where it fits into the manufacturing yeah, process. Yeah, well, this is quite similar really to uh, the way continuous division would have been constructed. So what I use is a fabricating technique. Um, it's been around for really, actually about the 1920s it started out of interest. It was actually so you could make large structures that were quite light. Um, uh, so you start off, everything comes out of flat plate, as continuous division did. Uh, you tend to use a box section, a hollow uh, box section. Uh, the, uh, there's usually four sides which are, are welded together with either arc welding or with MIG welding. We tend to use both of those. Uh, it's a pretty slow process of uh, welding the sections up. And then, as you can see, you probably have an idea that um, the welds uh, initially are raised. We have to grind them, we have to use a, a sanding just to get them back to quite a nice flat surface. And then with continuous division, uh, and, and as with this piece, all the edges are, are actually hand filed at the end. Uh, with continuous division, that was actually being hand filed as it went onto the truck. Yes, I remember that story <laughs> from yesterday. Uh, and the, 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 the feel and the look uh, of your pieces, uh, as we can see just down below here, mm. and a piece that's naturally aged, you were a little bit worried uh, given the time frames, because they're very tight time frames, mm. uh, from um, uh, uh, giving you the commission to actually getting it mm. on site, that you didn't think uh, that the piece would have aged adequately enough, but mm. that is not the way that you uh, mm. discovered it worked, is it? Yeah, well, World Expo, um, you're sort of making my memory bank sort of you know, come back into play now, mm. and World Expo um, back in '88, one thing they did say was, look, uh, we had a six week period to make the work, as I said before, but they said, look, anything, we, we, we can do anything. So I was worried about it, sort of, we, we can make the sculpture. Uh, if you see some early images, you'll see when it got up to Brisbane, it was quite raw. Mm. Uh, so I was worried about the time frame. They said, uh, if you like, we can con construct a, uh, like a humidity type crib over the whole sculpture out of plastic. And then when we got up to Brisbane, uh, by luck, uh, we installed the sculpture, uh, we made the sculpture in six weeks, we installed it and, and actually uh, there, there was quite a big rainstorm that came in that afternoon. Uh, so that rainstorm sent the sculpture off very, very quickly and I think within a day or two uh, it had good colour in it so we didn't have to construct the humidity crib. Yeah, and the gods were with you. The gods were with us. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, as they were with all of Expo I've uh, discovered with the stories as mm. they're knitting together. Um, and the colour, the colour is very important and the colour mm. leads us into your favourite baby, the Palmer Project, mm. um, which mm. has a continuance in relation to the Expo um, hereditary because obviously, mm. uh, you know, your start, your big start mm. was from Expo uh, and you've mm. been able to maintain the momentum in your mm. career uh, through all of us ups and downs mm. uh, and you're now working on um, the Palmer project. Just tell us a little bit about that, that yeah. baby. Um, yeah, well, Expo was certainly one of the early on in the career, one of the major things you know, was, I was involved with, so I was very pleased to get involved with it. Um, the work I'm making about that time and, and the World Expo piece I certainly still regard as being a significant work, but the work was what I describe as being a bit more international in feel. So the sculpture could have been made um, in Australia, but it probably could have been made in America, it could have been made in Europe. My work since then, for most of my work, not quite all of it, but it has moved probably towards having a bit more of an Australian feel to it. Mm. Uh, I think this is actually important for Australian sculpture right now, that we actually develop a sense of sculpture um, coming out of this place. You know, I think it's actually quite a big issue. Um, the steel I've used, I started using core 10 steel um, early on, actually inspired by one of my teachers, Owen Broughton, at art school. Um, some people think it was Clement Meadmore, but it wasn't, it was Owen Broughton. Um, and uh, Corten steel, though, has very much the colours that we get in the Australian landscape. So once you get away from the cities, 
uh, you know, you get into the interior bit, uh, you know, what, what forms all those wonderful rusty colours, mm. it's, it's iron that does it. Yep. That's one reason I've used the Core 10 for such a long period of time. I think it relates to this place far better than, than bronze and, and certain other, other materials which were developed in Europe really. So I think Core 10 uh, still sits very well in our landscape. And that's led on to, um, you know, through the last 37 years, so one of my major projects the last 10 years has been Palmer, which is 400 acres of land I bought about an hour out from Adelaide. And I've now placed close to uh, 30 works uh, on that property and, and nearly all these works except for one uh, have that very Australian feel to them. And um, with the, the, the colour of the steel we use with the, the Core 10, I think that steel again you know, sits in very well in that landscape. So pieces which have Australian uh, feel form-wise and conceptually and also through the materials I'm, I'm using as well, sort of engage that Palmer landscape, which is a very, it's, it's a drier, what I'd call archetypal sort of Australian landscape. It's a big rain rocks, shadow, isn't it? It's, it's rain shadowy country, yeah. more like the Flinders Ranges here, um, or equivalents, you know, you'd find uh, all around Australia. And that, that project, you have a biennial there, uh, that's an association with the Adelaide Arts Festival, as I understand it, mm. um, and there is, uh, if would like to get in contact with Greg and it's got a great web page, um, a, a wonderful video uh, which I just found fascinating last night watching it and it just gives a great history and a great feel of the artwork, all the different types of Greg's artwork um, and there's no one type uh, which you'd say oh that's a Greg Johns, there is a, a multitude of brilliant artwork. Uh, that Greg has uh, has done. So with that, we might just ra wrap up this uh, particular YouTube in the in the uh, the heart, the working heart of uh, Greg's life, uh, Thanks, and I'll navigate back to the uh, to the camera and turn it off. And uh, just stay tuned though, because I will be uh, rolling on uh, some of those photos that we spoke about of the artwork leaving and arriving at the expo site. Um, and with that, good morning, and we'll be back Thanks, with Greg. another YouTube.